uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak here this morning. It's great to see you all here. It's great to see the castle looking so well. Uh, things have changed quite a bit since Michael Collins took it over in 1922. <laughs> You'll notice I was in time this morning when Collins arrived to take it over. He was a few minutes late. And the British general in charge reminded him that he was late. And he said, well, what's a few minutes? We've waited 800 years for this occasion. <laughs> But everything is running very much on time this morning, so uh, I'm very pleased with that. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here for this session on economic governance and economic monetary union and the European Union. And I understand we're going to have a short discussion afterwards, and that will be helpful as well. It's an important discussion as we move into our presidency. It's our seventh presidency, and it also marks the 40th anniversary of Ireland joining uh, the European Union. And certainly we have made very significant progress, both socially and economically, in that 40 years. I'm not going to go into detail on the history of the, of, of, of the crisis, or indeed the history of the development of the economic and monetary union. I'd like to draw some conclusions on what we can learn from the past, though, even from the recent past. The structure of the EU economic governance was clear in the run-up to the crisis. The Euro, Eurozone central banks were independent and responsible for monetary policy. And the government and the member states were responsible for economic policy, including fiscal policy. And that looked like an acceptable division of labour and one that people thought would work, but under the stress of crisis, well, it didn't work that well. Uh, it is clear now that the, the, the construction of EMU had policy and practical weaknesses at that time. The treaties established a loose framework seeking to ensure national fiscal discipline and the coordination of economic policy more generally for all the member states of the Union. It is not clear before the crisis if Eurozone governments recognised that the national economic policy had an impact on economies of other member states. One would have thought that it was pretty obvious, but there seems to have been no recognition of the danger of, of, of feedback loops uh, coming back to haunt one's own economy. And uh, that's a concept that has been pretty well developed now, and we see uh, the, risk, uh, the risk of it. The Stability and Growth Pact was the main instrument for coordination of the member states' and national uh, fiscal policies in the EMU, but it wasn't enforced consistently. And I think everybody uh, remembers when some of the big uh, states of Europe decided to ignore uh, the limits of the Stability and Growth Pact and uh, then, as an instrument of fiscal control, it no longer worked once uh, the big countries broke the rules. Furthermore, the structure of economic governance was not capable of preventing large fiscal and economic imbalances in individual member states. Uh, not, o not only that, but essential structural reforms were postponed. So essentially, therefore, it became obvious as the Stability and Growth Pact uh, proceeded on its course and was largely ignored in some countries that there were weaknesses emerging that had to be addressed. The EU has often been criticised for its slow response to the crisis in terms of introducing improved economic governance measures. And I think it's worth having a look at that here today. In terms of institutional reform, we have a European Union of 27 member states, shortly to be 28, now, can we for, uh, forget the role of the European Parliament and the governance process of the Union? And change has to be agreed across the 27 and now with the Parliament. So the decision-making process is quite complex and it's very often difficult to get, uh, to get quick decisions uh, when, when we're dealing with European matters. But reforms are needed. And we all want to have them implemented swiftly. Uh, and if we can get a big bank solution, well, that, well that's great. But the changes have to be adapted and they have political consequences for all member states, not just for Ireland. And uh, then we have to bring the public with us as well. So there's a, a job to be done by all ministers to convince their citizens on the need for change. For example, to have external oversight over their budget processes, where none may have existed previously. Uh, frequently put up as a slogan, we're going to lose our sovereignty, uh, we'll no longer be making decisions over our own future. These will be dictated by Europe. And, you know, in that space, 
it's, it's quite difficult at times uh, to bring the people with one. So it's important for, for many countries, and, and the changes are difficult. Are difficult. So, but progress uh, certainly has been made, and uh, it would be a mistake to think that progress hasn't been made. Very often, when you're in a crisis, you don't see the progress. But if you look back, uh, you look at all the changes that have taken place over a two-year period, and, and it's worth uh, looking at that as well. If we look at the governance structures that were in place before the crisis, we can see how much has been achieved, and particularly in the last 12 months. Uh, the EU and member states have taken a series of important decisions that will strengthen economic and budgetary coordination. A significant package of financial service legislation has been developed, has been developed some of which has been agreed and some of which remains to be implemented. And I have discussed with uh, Commissioner Barnier how best we can process this because a lot of it will fall uh, into the responsibility of the Irish Presidency. Taking into account what will be achieved by the Irish Presidency uh, when they are making progress, we will take over the agenda then and advance it further. The financial sector reform has been complemented by financial sector supervisory institutions, which are cross-border, whereas previously we had national financial supervision. Uh, we have seen the development of the EFS and the ESM structures. So we have bailout funds, uh, we have firewalls now in place. Uh, when you think that the aid to Greece originally was given on a bilateral basis with a series of arrangements with individual countries, you can see now that there are central funds in place with set rules uh, to intervene uh, in any country in difficulty in the future. And uh, there have been various important and targeted interventions by the European Central Bank. I think Mr. Draghi uh, has built on the progress made by his predecessor and is creative and flexible. And certainly, if you look at the spreads on the bond markets, you can see uh, the influence of Mr. Draghi uh, on, on a policy basis. The Stability and Growth Pact was reformed by measures including a set of five regulations and one directive adopted in November 2011, affectionately known as the Six Pack. Uh, these included reform of the ex excessive deficit procedure for all member states, providing for shorter deadlines, greater focus on debt, and not just on deficits. There is also the imposition of sanctions using reverse qualified majority voting in the event of failure to comply with the requirements of the EDP process. This means that a qualified majority vote is required to reject the European Commission recommendation to impose sanctions. In addition to the six pack, the European Commission proposed two further regulations, uh, colloquially known as the two pack. Uh, these draft regulations propose common provisions for monitoring and assessing draft budgetary plans and ensuring the correction of excessive deficits in the euro area member states and strengthening economic and budgetary surveillance of member states in the euro area. While there has been significant work on the two-pack at the Council and in the Parliament, it has not yet been agreed, but the Cypriot government is quite active in its uh, dialogue with the Parliament and we would ho hope that the two-pack will be implemented before we take over the presidency. We can see further changes in the European semester process. The Europe 2020 programme, the Europe Plus Pact and regular European summits. We intend to progress the European semester process to a successful conclusion as part of our presidency and we will provide a comprehensive roadmap for 2013 uh, European semester process next month to the General Affairs Council. Clearly the pressure on all of the states to, is to engage with reforms and uh, you know, get the necessary uh, systems in place uh, that regulate the very complex human which is now emerging. Then, as well as the big event that's remembered in Ireland in, in, in terms of uh, these, these issues is the Fiscal Stability Treaty. And we put that through in uh, May of last year. Uh, it requires the budgetary position of general governments to be in surplus or in balance, and this will be deemed to be the case if the structural balance of general governments uh, is at our medium-term budgetary objective, our agreed adjustment path towards it, unless exceptional circumstances apply. There's a debt rule also, and the debt rule requires that the 
GDP ratio in excess of 60% has to be reduced or 60% by 120th e each year. Uh, some aspects of the introduction of these measures involved uh, treaty changes uh, and, for example, the introduction of the reverse qualified majority voting rule uh, could only be reduced by a, a treaty change. So, again, if you look at summary of where I've got to in, in these few words, we had a Europe where independent banks and the sovereigns looked after monetary policy. Independent governments and the sovereigns looked after fiscal policy on the general guidance of the Stability and Growth Pact. People didn't keep the rules on the Stability and Growth Pact. And when the bigger countries broke the rules, the rules didn't apply any longer as far as the rest of the other were concerned. So to protect the currency when the crisis hit, a whole series of measures had to be retrospectively fitted. And that's where we're at now. So you had the six pack, you had the two pack, you had the European semester, you had the, 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 the stability treaty, and various other measures around the edges, all in place now. And if they were all done together, it would look like a major piece of work. But because they were done seriatim, and uh, because there was uh, insufficient debate about them, and because, quite frankly, most people don't know what's meant by the six pack or the two pack, uh, you know, they didn't make the necessary impact. But it's, it's, it's not true to say that Europe has been floundering for the last 12 months and hasn't been taking action to address the crisis. It has, and in, in a very real way. <coughs> there are implications, of course, for Ireland uh, as well. And uh, we know what the difficulties were over the last couple of years. We've made substantial progress in our financial affairs, and we have made substantial progress in resolving the difficulties of our financial institutions. We've improved our competitiveness very significantly. And most importantly, uh, we have, we're in a space now where there's, there's growth in the economy again and where job creation is coming through, especially on, on the, uh, the multinational side. But we still uh, have to move on. Uh, it was in part the weaknesses in the design of the EMU, which it, it in part led to unbalanced and unsustainable growth in Ireland and to the difficulties which we went through. And the rules now require better discipline and that's not, that, that's not, a, that's not a, a, a bad thing. Uh, fiscal discipline is not the same as austerity. And I think we should remember that as well. And uh, you know, what is the alternative to the programs that we are uh, engaging in? Uh, one could pile deficit on deficit and debt on debt as the model and pretend that some small section of society can pay for it, tax the rich. But we tried that, you know. We tried that model. And it didn't work. And uh, there aren't that many more models around. So we have to pay our way in a big bad world. We have to get our budgets into balance. We have to get our debt under control. And we have to deal with the structure of the economy to continue to make it competitive uh, so that we can create those goods and services that other people want to buy. And as we do that successfully, there'll be employment for our people. Uh, that's the model. It's, it's very straightforward and very simple. And uh, it's considered, it's, it's, uh, it's described as the austerity model. But as I say, uh, getting your, your, your fiscal arrangements right is not the same as austerity. And that's the model we're on. So that, that's where we came from, and that's what the government's decisions that have been taken over the last couple of 12 months or so in particular amount to. Now, the next big project, of course, is banking union. And uh, it, it's worth reflecting on banking union. In my very first remarks, I said that, go back a little bit, and banks were the responsibility of sovereign governments. We're moving now to a situation not exactly like the United States, but it's worth thinking about what happens in the United States in banking to see where, where we might end up, where you'll have a, a central European united banking system. And of course, that's a big project. If you were designing a banking union when there wasn't a crisis, you might decide that you wanted a banking union for reasons of the single market. You know, you, that would be one motivation for a banking union to get your single market working more effectively. 
and certainly it would be benefits for that for there. But this particular banking union that's being proposed is not motivated by getting uh, the single market working more effectively. It's motivated by supporting the currency. And, you know, depending on your starting point, you're going to arrive in a different space. So we have to be very conscious of the single market as the banking union develops. But that's not the motivation for the banking union. The banking union's motivation is to uh, underpin uh, the currency. Now, the elements of it are straightforward, and you're familiar with them. The supervision, first of all, then resolution, and then deposit guarantee systems. The supervision uh, part of the project is running fairly strongly. A lot of work has been done, and the commitment is that it would be completed in January, and that, that there would be a system in place then uh, which would supervise the banks across Europe. There has been some debate and some difference of opinion on whether all the banks should be supervised centrally or just some of the systemic international banks. Uh, the policy position as enunciated by the Commission and which we'll, be dri which we'll be driving forward during our presidency is that all of the 6,000 banks or so in Europe will be, sort of, will be supervised in a unitary supervision system. The legal mandate for supervision will be vested in the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, but they will decentralise part <coughs> of the supervision to the local regulators. So you'll have a legal mandate allowing for supervision across the Union emanating from Frankfurt. That will give rise to uh, a rule book being developed in Frankfurt, which will be applicable everywhere. Manuals and protocols will follow, and then uh, you know there'll be direct supervision of 20, 25, 30 systemic international banks out of Frankfurt. The others will be decentralised and the regulation will take place by local regulators but operating to a uh, European mandate and operating to uh, very precise rule books and manuals and protocols and these are being developed uh, as we speak. There will be an override facility for, you, for, for Frankfurt. So if, they, if they're worried about a particular institution they can come in and do the direct regulation uh, in cooperation with the local regulator, but of course uh, the, the, the bank in Frankfurt will have the legal mandate uh, to come in and uh, supervise directly. As well as that, uh, this project isn't being conducted so that uh, supervision will be less thorough than it is now. So in very simple, I mean it sounds obvious but it's worth saying. In simple terms we want regulation to be at least as good as the best in Europe and probably better than anything that's happening in Europe now. And that would be the objective. So there's not pulling back of standards or reducing of standards. The objective is to, is to increase standards. Another very important issue as well is um, to make sure that the monetary policy role of the ECB is not confused with the regulatory role and that there isn't a spillover and that there'd be a kind of monetary policy through regulation. So it'll be very important that you know, the functions are absolutely separate and seem to be separate. And uh, the bank as regulator will operate as the bank as regulator. The bank as a monetary authority will operate in that space and that there will not be crossover. Now, who's going to join the banking union? Well, it goes into three, it goes into three groups of people, really. There's uh, all of us who are members of uh, the Eurogroup. Uh, we're, we're the insiders. and. Uh, uh, we'll be involved in the banking union. Then there's the other ten uh, who are not in the in the euro group. And remember, I said the motivation is to underpin the currency. So if you're not in the currency, you don't have the same motivation. But there are countries that have international banking systems that trade into Europe, and they divide into two groups again. They're, they're the people who are outside of the currency but want to be in the banking union and there are those who are outside of the currency and who don't want to be in the banking union. I suppose in the first group, uh, Sweden and, po and Poland would be very, very good examples of the first group, but obviously the supervisory regime has to accommodate them, and at least uh, you can't have people supervised who don't have a say in the method of the supervision. So accommodation must be made for those countries who want to be part 
uh, of the Banking Union and yet are not at present uh, within uh, the group that uh, have a say in these matters. Then there are other, uh, other countries, uh, the United Kingdom is the best example, who are totally in favour of a banking union, who are totally in favour of, a, of, a, of a, a successful euro currency, who have a huge interest in financial services because the City of London is the biggest centre of financial services in Europe, uh, and who want to make sure, at a minimum, that nothing is decided in Europe that affects their position adversely, but at the same time are not going to go in and be fully participating members uh, of a banking union. So there's a difficulty there, and this has to be worked out. So in terms of the banking union, on the mainstream, a lot of work has been done. And it wouldn't be difficult now to get the supervisory mechanism in place along the lines that I described for the 17. It's when you go beyond that uh, to the people outside of the 17 and the different dispositions that the accommodations have been made. But the policy is to ensure that it is open uh, to all members of the union to participate in banking union and in the common supervision. Uh, the resolution mechanisms uh, aren't as advanced uh, as uh, the, uh, the supervision mechanisms, uh, but uh, we're, we're working towards it. The Commission published a proposal on the 6th of June 2006 on, on resolution. The framework provides for comprehensive and effective arrangements to deal with failing banks at national level, as well as more complete arrangements to tackle cross-border banks. There are three distinct phases in the framework, preparatory and preventive measures, early intervention and resolution tools. And the Commission characterises the overriding objective of the framework to ensure that institutions in difficulties can be allowed to fail without risk to financial stability while avoiding costs to the taxpayer. Uh, we're fairly familiar with this space. Uh, we had Anglo-Irish Bank, and uh, in Spain they had Bankia. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you, if you only had supervisory rules for the top 30 banks in Europe, neither Anglo or Bankia yeah, would have been caught in the supervisory mechanism. So you can see why many of us think that uh, all the banks have to be supervised right across Europe. Because very often the, the, the trouble doesn't come from the, from, from the international uh, systemic banks. The trouble comes from kind of smaller, medium-sized banks. And you can see the potential for contagion in those two examples. So certainly they'll be within the supervision. So we've learned a lot ourselves from resolution. And we have our own resolution uh, legislation. Uh, but of course, uh, what's going to happen is that um, sovereign resolution arrangements are going to be blended into a European-wide resolution uh, mechanism. And what the timeline for that is not clear yet, but I would prefer it sooner rather than later. It has implications, of course. How would it be funded? Would the charge in some kind of fund for resolution purposes uh, be put on the banks? Or would it be put on the sovereigns? Obviously, our preference would be that it goes on, goes on the banks. Uh, it's also worth thinking uh, there's no point in going down this road if the supervision is less effective. So with better and a more effective supervision, the consequence should be that you'd have less need for resolution and working out of insolvent banks. And then if there's a, if there's a fund, a mutual fund, how far down the road towards mutualization of exposures uh, is there going to be in Europe? and who's, who ultimately is going to pay the bill. And this is why Germany are insisting that, you know, the supervision goes into place first, it has to be effective and working, and then we'll see about resolution. The other pillar, the third pillar, is the deposit guarantee scheme. And the current proposals represents a, a recast of the existing directive. The aim of the proposal is to enhance deposits' confidence by a higher level of coverage, faster payout, and improve funding of deposit guarantee schemes. And we are fully in favour of a robust deposit guarantee scheme <coughs> that promotes greater confidence. Uh, there has overall been a substantial degree of work under the Cyprus Presidency on the Banking Union Package. It is expected that not all of the Banking Union Package will be completed before the end of 2012, and it will be a priority for our Presidency. It is important for Ireland and for our debt sustainability that this package of measures is agreed and introduced 
It is, of course, important also for the European Union as a whole. Uh, finally, we have the four presidents' paper. Uh, what to read, as you'll see what uh, is in mind and what the, what the vision is for Europe. Uh, it's one important element, but uh, it came out in June and it's entitled Towards a Genuine Economic and Monetary Union. And it laid out four areas of necessary progress. Uh, more integration in our financial budgetary and economic policy frameworks and enhanced democratic legitimacy and accountability. And this paper is correctly looking ahead more strategically to the wider reforms that may be necessary for a more stable and prosperous Union. Professor, uh, President Van Rompuy presented an interim report to the European Council last month on the Economic and Monetary Union in which he, he, he brought forward ideas in relation to European fiscal capacity and arrangements of a contractual nature between member states and the European institutions. Others have floated ideas such as a possible European budgetary, budget commissioner or super commissioner. Uh, this isn't a, a very new idea. Uh, on the competition side, uh, the competition commissioner has the right to intervene directly without going through the College of Commissioners for direction. And if you had something similar on the financial and monetary side, um, maybe Commissioner Ali Rehm would have the same kind of ability. That would be one way uh, of doing this, and because there's a precedent, it doesn't like a huge leap in policy. Uh, but uh, it's only at the initial stages of discussion. So uh, when you think of what the presidents have said in their paper, and when you think of the enhancement of the democratic legitimacy of all the new initiatives, uh, it's quite far-reaching in terms of uh, the structures of Europe. And uh, you're looking at a, at a Europe that uh, will be integrated on a banking policy and a fiscal policy with a more developed single market. And when all that happens, uh, we'll see where the debate goes on democratic control. Uh, but uh, as the debate develops on economic, uh, on, on democratic control, it seems inevitable that there's going to be movement towards a, a, a more centralised political Europe. And I think it's in that space that there's going to be a very interesting debate indeed, because all the, the building blocks that are now being put in place, in my view, inevitably lead uh, to some form of political union, whether it's loose or tight. And I think that's where the great debate is going to be uh, over uh, yeah, the next number of years on how the European project <coughs> continues. Because governance is, 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 is necessary. Uh, governance is essential. Uh, we saw what the failure of governance got us to. But governance has to be legitimate as well. And the only legitimacy of governance is uh, if it has the will of the people behind it and that means political structures to reflect it. So if you read the President's paper, there's fairly clear signals, reading the lines and reading between the lines of what the vision of Europe is coming from the four Presidents, and it's a view that's shared by, by very many people. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.